gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about the person and the work of Christ is something that not only saves us, it continually saves us and sanctifies us and it infiltrates our life. As we come into the text this morning, big idea or a title for the sermon, critical countercultural instructions for the serious Christ follower. Critical countercultural instructions for the serious Christ follower. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy in Ephesus, and there's a lot of adverse conditions with Timothy in the church there. A lot of obstacles, a lot of opposition. People don't want to hear the gospel, they see it as beneath them. It's a culture that sees that Christianity is, is truly a, a tangential religion that, that doesn't matter in their day. Surely there are other ancient faiths who just be able to choose and pick what you want. But this God who calls for exclusivity is not very popular in the Greek world. As we read verse 8 to verse 12, it's classic Pauline writing because it's 105 words and it's one single sentence in the Greek. He's a true preacher. Doesn't know when to stop and put the full stop and give the listeners a break. But the reason he's doing this is to highlight that this is one thought. In our verses in our Bible, we may think that these are all separate thoughts, but this one sentence in Paul's mind is that they're all linked together. What he says all reinforces and matters and connects to each individual concept. So let's read, beginning in verse 8, down to verse 12. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. And which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Heavenly Father, we pray that these words that we just read, that you would bring them into our heart. We pray that you would glorify your name. We pray that this challenge to the church would not be deaf on our ears, but that truly we would hear these calls to not be ashamed, to stand for Christ and to charge forward in the boldness and the kindness of the Holy Spirit. Now speak your truth to us and in Jesus' name. Amen. Two thoughts. First one this morning. Do not be ashamed of Jesus or his people. Do not be ashamed of Jesus or his people. I'll give you the second thought in just a moment. But these are truly countercultural mindsets that I want to unpack. Because our world is ashamed of Christ. And many Christians weigh out in the moment, do I speak Christ or do I not? Do I stand for Christ or do I not? Is the moment, does it, does it weigh out the shame that I'm going to incur as a result for standing with Christ and his people? Maybe I will, maybe I won't. So number one, do not be ashamed of Christ or his people because the Apostle Paul says, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Now that therefore in verse 8, that therefore is a logical inference that is pointing back to verse 11. Since God has not given us a spirit of fear, but rather of power, love, and self-control, this is what he has made you. This is the Holy Spirit implanted within you. So be courageous in your blood-bought identity, brothers and sisters. This is who you are. 
To be ashamed of Christ is out of keeping with your identity. It's out of keeping with the Holy Spirit living within you. You do not have a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. So therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Lord, referring to specifically Christ. He who is the Lord, the, the captain of the church, the Savior who bought our freedom. Do not be ashamed about him or the testimony about what he is and what he has done. Because to the world, the message of Christ seems nonsensical. I mean, we, we, we preach this story about a guy who came and lived and then died on the cross, then rose again three days later. It just doesn't make sense. So people go to the stories, well, maybe he was just a good teacher like Confucius. Or maybe he was a spiritist like Buddha. But this just doesn't make sense because if God is God, would he come down in weakness? If God is God, would he truly manifest himself in this way? It doesn't make sense to the human mind. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 for just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul recognized that this message that we proclaim doesn't make sense out there. It does not make sense to the world out there. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. It's, it's foolishness. And then the Apostle Paul, again in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 22, says, For the Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. The Jews in this day and age, they're looking for the signs, the, the power signs, because they believe in Yahweh, who is the unconquerable God, who knows no weakness. And to see Christ in weakness just does not make sense to the Judaistic mind. And so they're looking for signs, powerful signs, of this Messiah who's going to come and he's going to conquer power, strength. The Greeks and their philosophies, the Platonists and the Aristotelians and the, the Greek philosophers, they're looking for logic and things that we can reconcile in our own minds and make sense of. But the Apostle Paul says, the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we cre preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. We preach a Messiah not strong like the Jews want, but weak and crucified. And we preach this death, which to the Greek mind, in logical sense, makes no sense at all. Because the gods of their minds would never subject themselves to such humiliation. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, so just a few verses down. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. God. Then look at verse 14 of chapter 2. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. When we say the natural person, the, the person who is born into their sin, in their base nature as a sinner, unredeemed, it makes no sense to that mind. And so what is the result? The world mocks and ridicules and says, what is this faith that you hold to? Do not be ashamed of the testimony and the message of Christ, Paul says. 
For in it lies the very power of God. Now, this is a mindset that I wish I could instill in everybody, that when we speak Christ, it is not just simply a message. It is not just simply a story. But when you speak the words of Christ, the gospel of Christ, embedded in that message is the very omnipotent power of God who has pleased and has been pleased to channel out the power that changes lives and brings hell to its knees through the proclamation of Christ. It is through Christ. It is through the preaching of Christ. It's through the sharing of Christ, the living of Christ, the exaltation of Christ. That is what causes demons to run and flee. This is why we preach Christ here at Heritage. It's not a curiosity how many of you, Heritage is the largest church you've ever been a part of? Like, hand up if this is the largest church you've ever been a part of. Okay. So there have been a number of you who've been a part of other large churches. Uh, Heritage is a larger church. But we've never had a strategy for growth. We've never had a marketing plan trying to figure out how to get people in here. Now, this is not thump our chest by any means. This is just simply a reality. I've been asked many times, even over the last several years, hey, what's your strategy for growth? How did you guys get so big? And I kind of look and I, and I say, you know how we, we're not trying to grow? What we're trying to do is be faithful to God's word and exalt Christ. And you know what we find? People are hungry to hear about who Jesus is. They want to hear about a substance and a message that is greater than themselves. And at the same time, it offends others. We don't have a marketing plan to grow. We just simply have a desire to preach Christ and Christ crucified. And we pray that God is honored through that. Some of you, by the way, are going to go into ministry vocationally, especially some of you younger people. I want to instill this into your minds and into your ways of thinking. That the power is not in the programs. It's not in the talent that you hold. It is in the living Christ. So preach him, proclaim him, and share him faithfully. Do it shamelessly. Do not be ashamed. Now, what does it mean to preach or proclaim Christ? And I want to unpack this for just a moment because I also don't want to think that just because you, you invoke the name of Christ almost like a talisman or some sort of magical word that that is the thing that brings blessing. No, preaching and understanding Christ and proclaiming Christ and keeping Christ central is a way of thinking as we look at God's word. Let me give you six of them briefly, okay? Number one. Preaching Christ, proclaiming Christ, keeping that Christ centrality, number one, is a way that you look at Scripture with Christ at the center. It is looking at Scripture not for just strength for how to get through the day for myself, but it's looking that all of Scripture itself finds its locus, finds its fulcrum, finds its centrality in the person and the work of Christ. Luke chapter 24, verse 25, and I would add that these are the very words of Christ. We say that, but I also want to challenge you. The red letter words of your Bible are no less authoritative than the black words of your Bible. They're all inspired by the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ. But this is what Jesus said to two disciples on the road to Emmaus when they didn't believe. He says, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets... The prophets, Old Testament, have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer suffering? As you read through chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, the theme of suffering and do not be ashamed and the reality of suffering as a Christian is just kind of baked into the Christian mindset. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then in verse 27, and beginning with Moses, which is the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and all the prophets, Daniel, Ezekiel, and some even considered David a prophet. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus looked back on the Old Testament and said, 
Let me show you how all of this spoke about me. Preaching Christ, proclaiming Christ, and keeping Christ central is a way of looking at Scripture with Christ at the center. Number two, it is reading Scripture and noting the themes, images, and events that progress the plan of redemption toward Christ. As we read through the Old Testament, read through it in its day. Read through it in its setting. See what is plainly seen, but at the same time, keep in mind out for those images and themes that progress the narrative and the the history of redemption to fulfillment in Christ. Some examples. The ark, Noah's ark, as a vessel of deliverance from total destruction. Imaging Christ as the vessel of deliverance from total destruction. Exodus as a divine deliverance out of slavery and into the promised land. And in the book of Hebrews, the writer actually says that the Exodus being out of death and the promised land into life, which we look forward to in heaven. Sinai as the place of covenant so God can dwell with man. And then the temple as the place of access to God. And that blood sacrifice is the means of satisfying God's wrath. And once you start putting all of these pictures and images together, and then you come to Christ, you go, huh, all of this seems familiar. A blood death on the cross in our place, purchasing access to God through a covenant in order to deliver us out of death into life. And he is the only ark of deliverance and means from the total destruction that we deserve as humanity. You see how the dots connect there? Do not read scripture without seeing Christ as the culmination of it all. Number three, It is seeing the wisdom of Scripture as painting a divine portrait that is manifested in Christ. It is seeing the wisdom of Scripture as painting a divine portrait that is manifested in Christ. So when you read the Proverbs or you read the law or you read the instructions on morality and and truth and holiness, all of these instructions are painting a portrait of who God is, what He loves, And also what he hates. And it's this divine portrait that as it's been building through the Old Testament, when Christ comes on the scene in the Gospels, we go, they're one and the same. Their character is the same. They love the same things. They hate the same things. Number four, it is noting the holiness of God and man's utter need for a Savior. As you read through the Old Testament, a lot of the stories, whether it be 1st, 2nd Kings or Judges or many of the other portions of Scripture, even into the prophets and the rebellion of Israel and the exile of Israel, it is the constant highlighting that despite Israel's blessings, despite the access to truth, a man is utterly wicked and goes his own way. Again and again, the Old Testament screams that that mankind needs a savior, that mankind needs a deliverer, that is not just simply deliverance out of the circumstances of slavery, Egypt, but actually deliverance from the slavery of the sin of one's heart. It is not just societal circumstances, but it goes to the very core that even King David himself The greatest monarch was a sinner and recognized he needed a saving God. Number five, Christocentricity or keeping Christ at the center also is, number five, the deep reveling of the gospel, the person and the work of Christ and all that it accomplishes. As we read through 1 Timothy and Titus and 2 Timothy, how many times does the Apostle Paul actually come back to the gospel again and again so that the churches do not just see it as salvation in an ambiguous sense, but in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, the salvation training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness 
and to purify himself of people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Every time Paul comes back to the gospel, he seems to revel in it. He loves it. He talks about it. And he exhorts people to declare it, to live in it, to let the gospel propel them onto good works and obedience. Number six, it is the zealous expectation for the return of Christ and his visible enthronement, his universal reign, and his eternal exaltation. So keeping Christ at the center is not just simply the past events, but it's also the zealous expectation for his return, his visible enthronement, his universal reign, and his eternal exaltation. It's a passion and an excitement that when we get to Revelation 22, 20, and we get done reading our Bible after that year reading plan, and you get to the end and it says, Surely I am coming soon. And after you've read Genesis to Revelation, you get to that point and the people of God say, Amen, come Lord Jesus. There's a zealous passion to want to see Christ and his universal reign. So do not be ashamed, Paul says. Do not be ashamed of this testimony that runs from Genesis to Revelation. And maybe this instruction is needed because Timothy and the church in Ephesus needed extra encouragement to not let their love for God grow cold. Do not be ashamed of the testimony. Do not be ashamed nor of me, his prisoner. Paul is in chains by the Romans at this point. To openly associate with Paul, who is a prisoner of the Roman state, is to throw in your association and lot with an enemy of the state. What is the effect of this? To open yourself up to ridicule, mocking, slander, false speak, people even spreading rumors and lies about you. It is evident that many had already weighed the shame and made the decision because it actually says down in verse 15, Paul says to Timothy, you're aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me. They weighed the shame and said, I don't want to be known with that guy. There is a strong temptation to feel ashamed of identification with the people of God. I don't want to be ashamed of Christ, but I kind of want to live my faith by myself and apart from the church and the people of God. And there is a growing trend of not wanting to be named with the people of God, even among Christians. Now, there's different reasons for that, and sometimes it's hurts within the church by fellow sheep, not wanting association with a specific group maybe because of political reasons or whatnot. Let me say this, though. In the church, there are going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. Jesus said that. Don't give Satan a softball to hate the church because you ran into some wolves dressed as sheep. Oh, and by the way, we are a church of broken people. It's not an excuse for the brokenness. But you should come into church with the understanding that I am coming as a sinner to meet with other sinners to try and figure out how to sin less and glorify God more. That means you're going to run into annoying people who you're not happy to see in the hall. Will you give Satan such a softball that because there are other sinners like you in the church that you're going to dismiss and dissociate from the people of God? Let me be very clear. The church is the visible Christ on earth. We are called the body of Christ, the people of God, and to be ashamed of the people of God is to be ashamed of the visible Christ. You cannot love Christ and hate the church. To love Christ means to love that which he spilled his blood for. Now, does that mean emotionally you always feel a great sense of joy and happiness about all the people that compose the church? No. And so you have to follow through on the obedience of how to reconcile and to deal with bitterness and offenses, Matthew 18, and to love one another even as Christ loved you. But do not be ashamed of Jesus and his people. Number two, share in the suffering for the gospel. So the first point is 
Do not be ashamed of the church or don't be ashamed of Jesus or his people. Number two, we now have an imperative. Do not be ashamed. Sorry, do not be, goodness gracious. Number two, imperative. Share in the suffering for the gospel. There's the imperative. Share in the suffering for the gospel, specifically suffering for naming and proclaiming Christ. Now, by this point, you must understand that Paul himself had endured extraordinary suffering for the gospel. So that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, Paul describes, he says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Night and day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger, and robbers. Now, let me stop there for just a moment. Because what he's describing are physical dangers. In other words, Paul is a missionary going to the uttermost regions to share the gospel of Christ. And by exposing yourself to traversing the landscape, as it were, you are exposing yourself to physical dangers. Is the gospel worth it to you to do that? Are you willing to go overseas for the sake of the gospel and share in the suffering for the gospel, even if it does mean malaria, which I've had four times. It's not pleasant or typhoid, or any number of bacterial infections, or, or risking the roads. I remember on a road in southern China, south, east, southwestern China, right, C- kind of close to the, t- the Tibetan region, and we were driving on roads that were literally like, I don't know how the, the van didn't top off. It was, it was a road bus, look down outside your window, and it was a 3,000-foot escarpment drop. I mean, if that bus, and I'm, I'm looking out, And I'm not looking at any road. I'm looking at the tire and the drop off and no guardrail. And then I see my driver like turn around and like talking to the guy in the second seat. And I'm like, pay attention. (laughs) Right? But there may not be guardrails when you go to share the gospel. Paul describes that reality. He also says dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles. Now he moves into societal dangers. Verse 27, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night. It's hard work. Brother and sister in Christ, following Christ is hard work. But Paul issues here a call that his experiences are to be shared as a part of the normative Christian experience, particularly elders like Timothy, but indeed to all who are serious about following Christ. Now, as Paul is describing this, look look at the imperative. It is share in the suffering for the gospel. He's giving a normative shape of the Christian experience, and this is what it looks like. The shape of the Christian experience is humility, suffering, endurance, and hope for the consummation, hope for the return of Christ. That suffering is a normative part of the shape, as it were, of the Christian life. Now, why? As Paul unpacks this, not only here, but in other passages. Why is the shape of the Christian experience humility, suffering, endurance, maybe even death, as we wait for the final day? And the reason is because as the church, as the people of God, this is the shape of the life of Christ. The shape of the life of Christ on earth was rejection, humility, suffering, death, looking forward to the expectation of what God will accomplish. And if we are his people, look at through the entire New Testament and the instructions are imitate Christ. Have this mind which was also in Christ Jesus. Walk worthy of Christ. The shape of the church, the shape of the Christian life is victory through weakness. Power in humility. Conquering by suffering. Marching on our knees. Patiently enduring hardship. Forgoing earthly comforts for heavenly rewards. And rejection as a regular occurrence versus a church that conquers through outward strength, visible earthly power, eloquent messaging, and the expectations of quick successes and earthly rewards and comforts. Paul says share in suffering for the gospel. 
by the power of God. Now notice the link here. He says, share in the suffering for the gospel, for the gospel, by the power of God. It's not a religious effort on your own means. And this is very important because many religions in our day and even back in Paul's day, it was suffering as part of the salvific journey. In other words, your suffering, your monasticism contributed to your salvation. But the Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God, that power that he's already accomplished in you. It's not your own effort, it's his strength. It does not contribute to your salvation. Matter of fact, be reminded, Timothy, that your salvation is not rooted in your performance, but it is rooted in God's grace that he saved you in the first place. So he says, remember how he saved us, called us to a holy calling, a holy identity, a holy identity that includes suffering. Even as, remember Isaiah 53, what was the calling of the Messiah himself? He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He has borne our griefs. We esteemed him stricken. He was smitten by God, afflicted, pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. And then Jesus himself says, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. So if the holy calling of the Messiah included suffering and endurance, how much more his people. But remember that he saved us not because of our own works. Your salvation is not bound up in your works, not even your suffering. You've been saved by his grace. Why? Purely according to his own purposes and grace. Brothers and sisters, especially with issues of divine providence, which by the way, it says was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. You know what I hear in this passage? I hear the doctrine of election, the doctrine of God's providence, the doctrine of God saving people not according to their works before they had any chance to believe, to think, to do anything right or wrong. God purposed in his heart to save a particular people. Before the ages began, I did not put that in there. It is there. Now, as we encounter these things, be reminded that sometimes we obsess over the how where the Greeks looking for wisdom. How do I reconcile the illogical? And we end up in theological black holes. But our faith is just that. We have a God who is bigger than us and we have to allow for, by faith, the seemingly irreconcilable contradictions. For instance, please explain to me how Jesus is fully God and fully man. But we, by faith, accept it as a reality. Or that God, in his purposes, according to his own grace, saves us and declares us and elects us before the ages began. And yet, at the same time, if you deny him, you are responsible for your own damnation. Scripture says that. So believe by faith. The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, suffer. Share in the suffering. It's not your work, it's his be reminded that your salvation itself was all his work and had nothing to do with you, that you are secured in him. And because you're secured in him in an unshakable covenant of salvation, Timothy, church, stand upon that gospel of grace. Be not ashamed. Share in the gospel because this beautiful gospel, is it not worth suffering for? Listen to the apostle Paul as he closes out in verse 11 and 12. For which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, for which is why I suffer as I do. It's this calling that brings him suffering. But he's willing to do it. Why? Because this grace that was appointed before the ages began, verse 10, has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus, who abolished death, now, when it says abolished, the Greek word here has the idea of rendered inoperative. 
Not that we still see death even today, but in other words, the power of death has been rendered moot through the sacrifice of Christ for all who believe in him to give them life and immortality. And Paul says, by proclaiming this message, I suffer. But share in the suffering, brothers and sisters. And then he concludes with this incredible confession in verse 12. After laying out the gospel, after laying out the call, here at the end of his life, as he's facing death in prison, this is what the apostle Paul says. I am not ashamed. I know whom I have believed. He's not dead. He's alive. I'm going to see him again. He is going to win the day. So I am not ashamed. I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced, my affections, my mind, I am convinced that he's going to win the day. I am convinced that he's able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me, which includes my salvation, which includes everything that God has made me. Therefore, if I lose it all, so what? For me to live is Christ is gain. To die is also gain. Because that means I'm going to be with him. I'm going to live with him for all of eternity. So I know whom I have believed, Paul says. Timothy, church, do you know whom you've believed? So that the love of Christ exercises and expunges the fear of the world. Do not be ashamed. Share in the suffering for the gospel. See what you have been given. I mean, is Jesus worth the job loss, the ridicule, the inconvenience? Boomers, that generation, you grew up largely in a culture where your faith was fairly protected. Gen Zers, you guys, you young people, I think by the end of your lifetime, you're going to have to decide publicly whether or not you will name Christ or lose your home, lose your education, lose your job, maybe even go to prison. Maybe that's a little bit of doom saying. What I am saying is that the culture, the cost of being a Christian has gone up exponentially. We live in this protected little 200-year segment of history where we have gotten used to being able to gather in large groups like this. But when Uncle Sam says we can no longer meet, do we rise up in rebellion or do we believe that Christ will build his church and whether it be in a home or under a tree like the Maasai people or in an alleyway like people in China, will we still stand and say, to live is Christ? To die is gain. I will suffer because I know whom I have believed and one day he will win the day. I will be obedient. I will not be ashamed. I will share in the sufferings of Christ. Will you go to the nations? Will you sacrifice for those who are going? Will you take up the mantle of eldership? Will you be bold in your workplace? Will you brave the hostility of your family. O oh, church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Help us as a church to not be ashamed of the testimony of Christ. Help us not to recoil in fear. Help us to share in the sufferings for the gospel for the glory of Christ. And we pray, O oh God, that you would be exalted in and through us. Thank you, Lord, that our salvation is secure in your sovereign providential plan. But Lord, I pray that you would also help us to be faithful, to go and proclaim repentance, believing in Christ by faith, that according to your hand that you would draw many people to yourself. And if there is someone here that does not know you, I pray that they would make that decision today. And if you've not trusted in Christ, but you know that you stand on the precipice of hell and heaven, you stand on the precipice of judgment. 
and you want to talk to someone, you, you want to pray and say, I, I want to know how I can be saved, would you just slip up your hand quietly? You say, I want to know. I want to believe. Help me, oh God. There will be people down here at the front that love to pray with you. Don't leave this place. Believe. Know. Know whom you have believed. And Heavenly Father, help all of us as we leave this place to not be ashamed, but to follow you with full zeal and passion of heart to the glory of Jesus Christ. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.